A couple of months ago, I tore down a 27 EcoBoost out of a 2018 F-150. And since I posted that video, I've had lots of requests for the previous generation. And as luck has it, my friends Troy and Eric up at Robertson's Used Auto Parts up in Mapleton, Illinois, got a core in, thought of me, and sold it to me. So without them, this wouldn't happen. This is a 2.7 liter EcoBoost from a 2015 through 17 F-150. Now this is a core return, so I don't have miles, I don't have a VIN number to go off of, I don't have any history whatsoever. And a core return basically means when a salvage yard sells a used engine, they will charge 150 or some amount of money for the old one. So you return the old one, you get that much back, and then that's where I come in and I buy these cores. That's how a lot of these engines end up on this shelf. But I don't buy this generation of F-150, so without them, I may not have been able to find this. Now this is a 325 horsepower, 375 foot-pound of torque engine, and I hear lots of really, really, really good things about these engines. Not a whole lot of bad stuff either. The last engine I tore down was the second generation and it had a few things that we liked, a few things that we didn't like. Overall I thought the engine construction was superb. It was very overbuilt and it had a few things that were not so great, which is pretty much all modern engines. This particular 2.7 is out of an F-150 and I don't know what the differences are between this 2.7 liter and the 2.7 liter that comes in the Fusion Sport and the Edge. I'm not Sure, I'm sure that the overall engine design is the same and lots of components are shared, but I'm also positive that there are going to be some differences between the two and you can't just take an F-150 engine and put it in a front wheel drive timing cover. I'm sure there's a lot of things that are different, but these engines are very similar construction to the 6.7 Power Stroke. There's a lot of overlap in the design architecture you'll see. So if you're used to working on one of those engines and you probably saw this in the last 2.7 teardown, some things may look just a little familiar. The very first thing I'd like to do is turn this engine over. It still has plugs, it's still a complete engine, so there should be some compression. Seems to turn over all right. I don't feel anything loose in there. Boy, I hope we don't tear down a good engine today. That would be unfortunate. This engine still has its spaghetti of a wire harness. So we're gonna try to work around that so we can get the uh, spark plugs out and take a look at those. I don't know how these connectors work. Well, I think I can kind of, no, nope, I can't work around this. This is, this is preposterous. There's so much stuff in the way. I'm pretty sure every connector on this harness has a locking tab. You know it's not going to just disconnect itself, that's for sure. Okay, now we can get the plugs out after all that. This side has some stuff that looks like it's been undone. Not everything. Looks like one of these was disconnected. So that might be a clue. Oh no! That wasn't too bad. That was tight. I believe that these plugs had been removed and retightened because these were significantly tighter than this bank. This is the right-handed passenger bank, left-hand bank. These are also original plugs because they still have the painted dot on their tips. None of the plugs are bent. There's no smashed electrodes. Not a lot of damage. They're pretty dark and dingy looking. I don't think this truck had a ton of miles on them. Still original plugs on a turbo vehicle. I, I think it probably was running pretty consistently across the cylinders. This is the only one that looks a little different and it's not even it's not even that much different. So there's no no giveaway clues yet. 
Now I'm going to take a minute and get the rest of this wire harness off. There's a lot to this. And the harness is off. Looks like it's in good shape too. I don't see any damage connectors. The next thing we're gonna do is start stripping the stuff that goes around the intake manifold. Some of the coolant lines, vacuum lines. This is all boost control stuff here. Pull that off the bit. Looks like a boost sensor here. All right, there's the entire boost control system. Would you just... There's some vacuum lines. There's vacuum source on the plenum. That will come off with the plenum here. Okay, that was just a little work. All right, now I think the upper manifold, the plenum, will come off. Blue, pretty sure I've got all the bolts out. I just had to break the seal. Uh, a whole bunch of dirt just went falling, falling down into those intake ports. It's fine. Well, it may be hard to see in here. But keep in mind, this engine only has direct injection and not port injection and direct injection like the 2018 and later. So that is one improvement from the first generation that the second generation has. And this isn't terribly dirty. It's not great. I really did expect to see much worse because obviously it cost Ford quite a bit to put port and fuel port and direct injection on these engines. And that one's pretty crusty looking. That one has a little bit of debris in it. I mean, they're not perfect. I don't see any metal bits or any cause for concern. I've seen direct injection engines look much worse. Next, we'll start removing the turbochargers. We'll start with the right hand bank. The oil drain. The way they have these lines is pretty interesting. I'm sure they're a ton of fun in the vehicle. Let's see, can we even get these out? I don't know if these will get loose or not. Hey, look at that. Oh, a bunch of oil. That's the oil feed for the passenger side turbo. There's a little bitty screen on there that can catch some debris, but I don't see any. It looks clean. All right, now we just have to get the return line out of the block. Oh, off the block, right? Like so. And I've got three bolts that hold the turbo to the cylinder head. All that's left, this bolt, this bolt, and this bolt. Really two of them are studs. And the turbo is off. Now for the other side. Ooh, this side's a little bit more difficult. Let's get this oil feed line out first. Oil return, already loose. Coolant lines. This is pretty crusty on this side. Get the other coolant line off the head here. It's a very interesting fitting. Well, in order to get the oil feed line off the turbo, I have to take this off. Or I guess I could just remove it with the turbo. So at this point, it's time to unbolt the turbo from the cylinder head. And the turbo's off. All right, both turbochargers are off. This one has virtually no play. Spins nice. Uh, impeller does not hit the housing. This turbo looks pretty decent. I gotta check the wastegate. Virtually no play in the wastegate either. Now this turbo, this has a little bit of in and out play. Not that kind, but it spins nice. 
But if you look, look at the color of the inside of that turbine housing, the exhaust housing is just, it's been burning oil is what it looks like. And it looks really bad. Look how wet that is. Maybe, see typically when a turbo is blown, you don't see oil, burnt oil in this area. This will be clean. And if the turbo is pushing oil past the seals, you'll see it in this area. So maybe it's the engine that's causing that. All right, so here are the filters that are in the head. These are for the oil feed lines for the turbochargers. This is the right one. The right one looks good. The left one, not so good. I see some little bitty flecks of metal in that one. And that had to come from somewhere. It's not awful, but you shouldn't find metal in the oil. Not like that. Which is why the very next step is going to be to pull the oil filter. I understand this may not look ideal. Sorry, Brett. Hopefully your saw is well lubricated now. Now we can cut this with a blade. Look at that. It's like a script of how not to, uh, how not to take care of an engine. So here's a better look inside that filter. And as you can see, there's a few metal specks in here. It's not loaded up. Some of this I would imagine is from cutting it, but not the metal. Those glistening specks, that's not from cutting this. So obviously that metal came from somewhere and I bet that when this engine comes all the way apart, we'll find out where. The next thing we need to do is pull the valve covers. We're gonna start on the left-hand side, get the dipstick out of the way. It's dry, thank God. Let's get this engine bracket, engine lift bracket out. And now we can unbolt the valve cover. Well, I got a bracket here to tackle first. Now we can unbolt the valve cover. Okay, will this come right off? No. We need blue for that. I don't know where. We're going to pry. I remember the valve covers on the Gen 2 being particularly difficult as well. I think it's the spark plug tube seals. Will you just... Yep, I think we're making some progress now. And we're off. Well, this engine looks pretty clean inside. No varnish to mention. I don't see any sparkles. No forbidden glitter. All the valve trains where it's supposed to be. Chain looks okay. No excess slop. The side looks pretty decent. Let's go to the other side. First, the engine lift bracket. This one looks like it's bent in the way. Oh, that's not good. That worked. While I was zipping bolts out, I glanced in the filter housing and wouldn't you know it, there's some forbidden glitter in there. Well, this engine looks pretty good so far. Obviously, we know we've got problems. We saw some sparkly stuff. But this looks like it's had oil changes on time. Virtually no varnish. And there's some dirt in here, but that could have come from when I uh, removed the valve cover. I don't see any other cause for concern. The next thing we're going to do is work on the fuel system. We're going to get all the lines loose and we'll get this pump off, get this housing off the back of the cylinder head. I 
There's the high pressure fuel pump. I think I can probably pull this out now. There's the roller lifter for that. That looks like it's in good shape. Now, the fuel pump housing. Just give it a little tap. And it's off. Nothing to see here. And while we're back here, we'll get this vacuum pump removed from the back of the left hand cylinder head. That's probably not the right way. Perfect. Now when I removed this vacuum pump, I noticed it has an oil supply with a little bitty screen and look what's in the screen. It's not supposed to be there. The last thing I'd like to do at the back of this engine is remove the coolant feed hoses. There's just some fittings that bolt to the cylinder head. They're easy. And I say easy because I'm working on it on a stand and not in a truck. You guys that work on these in trucks, you know what I mean. Uh, well, I don't know if this is coming out or not. There's one. There's two. Man, this hose is just... I wish I could do something about this. There, are you happy? I'm happy. Now we're going to pay some attention to the front of the engine. We're going to remove the oil cooler, this pump here. And we'll get the water pump and that stuff in a minute. All right, let's get the pan in place. I think I've got all the bolts out. Sure do. Bone dry. Well, not really bone dry, but ah, ah. I spoke too soon. Now we can tackle this water pump. This looks like it's got a bunch of eights and uh, one 10 millimeter. We'll get that one out first. Always got to be one different type of fastener on every part. This should just pop off. There's going to be a little bit of effort to get it off of this O-ring here. We're leaking. Oh, there's a, a dowel right here. Right at the bottom of that pump. That's what's keeping this thing. I'm coming off. There we go. Ooh, it's still got some coolant in it. Ooh. Ooh, I don't know if I can show it that way. Water pump looks good. Coolant looked good. No play. I don't see any debris in here. This is an excellent, excellent condition water pump. It's got a date code from 16, so this is out of a 16 or 17. This looks fantastic. Well, that was pretty impressive. It did break the shaft, but didn't break the housing. I mean, look at all this damage. I guess Ford does make some good water pumps. Next, let's get this crank pulley off. And we're out. Now we'll work on getting the rest of these bolts out of the timing cover, starting with this tensioner oil pan bolts. Next we have just a couple of 13 millimeter bolts. I think these are the only two that are left. I don't think that one needs to come out. 
that's Loctited in. I do believe it's ready to come off. I think there's places to pry. Ooh, it looks like I got a couple more oil pan bolts that I missed. Usually helps to get the bolts out. Hmm. This side's gonna get a little tap. I think there's a doll right there. There we go. And time to cover is off. Little dingy, but not terrible. Not terrible at all. The timing system appears to be in pretty good shape. I don't really see any guides that are coming apart. I don't see any loose chunks of anything. Although when you look way down here in the pan, little bits of uh, silver sparkles pretty consistent with what we've seen in the rest of this engine. But one thing I really do like to see is a chain driven oil pump. Whereas the 2018 and later uses a belt and I understand it's a fiberglass reinforced belt or something Kevlar reinforced belt. That's probably the right word, but this has a chain. It's much better. I bet you could use those parts on a later generation. I would bet. Now it's time to peel the timing system off. We're just going to start zipping bolts off until parts fall off. We'll start with the one under the most tension. Oh, see, it's fine. You guys were worried. Maybe you weren't. That rail looks pretty good. A little bit of wear, but it's not terrible. This has even less wear. You could reinstall this. See, can we get this first chain off? Oh yeah. Exquisite. Tensioner number two. Everything looks pretty good. See anything, no cause for concern. Pretty much identical wear, just a little bit. This one is pretty much perfect too. Now I can't get that chain off and get that off, but I need to get some of this oil pump chain stuff off. So I guess I'm gonna unbolt some of that stuff so I can get the other side, the other banks chain. One thing I didn't really understand, maybe it's just packaging, is why you wouldn't put the oil pump chain on the outside or all the way on the inside. Why sandwich it between the two? It just seems like it would create more work but I'm not a designer. I'm just a guy that takes bolts off until parts fall off. Yeah, all these look pretty good. I don't see any, any damage at all. Can I get this off please? Yes. Look at that. Just marvelous. Now we get the solenoids out. I thought I could just pull those out. I was wrong. I mean, blue will get the job done. So I've made mention before that these are pretty good at picking up bits of metal. And if you look right there, that's bits of metal. Now, before I cram these caps loose, I would normally remove the cam gears, but in, in some situations like this, I can pull them with the cams and that's what we're going to do. Nope, that one needs a few taps. Actually, it looks like there's a place to pry. Well, the cam journals have a little bit of wear. That one looks pretty dry. 
and that one's got some sparkly substance in it, but none of them are too torn up. Looks like most of the rollers have uh, some damage as well. I don't think that would cause any lasting problems, but it is worth mentioning. The camshafts look pretty decent. I don't see a ton of wear on them. I don't see any damaged lobes or journals. I think these would definitely be worth reusing. Probably would replace the phasers though. The caps look pretty similar to the journals. Not bad. Really isn't too bad. Now it is time to crack the head bolts loose. Now it's time to lift the first head. Let's make sure that I'm not going to get caught on anything here. No, I think I'm good. It's going to come with the injectors. Do I have to break the seal on this one too? Oh yeah, we're going to, we're going to leak a little bit. Now I should be able to get it off with relative ease. That's not what's supposed to happen. The head dowels are ridiculous on this engine. Head gasket looks good. There's definitely some carbon in here, but nothing looks too bad. We should do our test. Yeah, we'll do our test. I think everything's good. So the two bores that you can see don't look too bad. A little bit of a wear there at the top. But I don't see any damage to any of the pistons. I don't see any really deep grooves. So far, so okay. It's a little bit of uh, junk in the cooling system though. And this side of the head looks pretty good as well. I don't see any major damage. Now we're going to go back to the other bank and do the very same thing. This side. Yep. Look at that right there. That's a bunch of metal that's not supposed to be there. Now we can crack these loose. Similar story on this side. No major damage, but there's still signs of fine, finely powdered, what I'm going to assume is bearing material, but we don't know that yet. The uh, rollers on the rockers look a little bit better on this side. Cam caps show similar wear, but nothing major which is pretty surprising for the metal that we have found so far. Camshafts look pretty much perfect. I don't know if these have much value, but there's not a lot of damage to them, if any at all. So if these are worth selling, they will be sold. Here's some of that metal we found on the uh, variable valve timing solenoids, VCT solenoids. They're, uh, it's not loaded, but it's also not supposed to be there. And once again, Head bolts. Much like the other bank, I'm going to give this a little uh, 
help. It looks like they gave you a place to pry on. <laughs> Whoopsies. That might have scared me. Uh, I think I should be able to wiggle this off. Come on, you can do it. Come on. These dowels are not normal dowels. You would think they'd go around the head bolts. They'd be a lot easier to deal with, but they have their own dowels in the block. And we're off. Well. Head gasket looks okay. Well, right off the bat, there's a problem. You're not supposed to look like that. Where did the rest of the piston go? And, oh, I see, it's melted to the cylinder wall. So this thing must have run lean and broke a piston. That would explain why one of the turbos looked like it had been ingesting oil in the exhaust side because it was through that through that cylinder. The rest of these look pretty good. Some vertical scratches, but not terrible. It's just that one. That's bad. Now it's time for our test. I think it has a good set of rods in it. So that cylinder looks okay. That cylinder looks okay. That cylinder has melted bits of aluminum fused to the valves. Just little bitty tiny specks all over here. It's generally not supposed to look like that. Now will that ruin the cylinder head? I don't think so, but it will definitely need to be checked at a machine shop. Now it is time to roll this thing over, let the rest of whatever fluid's in here out so we can pull the lower oil pan. I'm trying to keep most of this in the pan. Oh, that's a lot of oil. That's a lot of oil. Is this thing not drained? No, it was drained. Yeah, it just finished draining on my floor. Now it is time to pull the lower oil pan, which is plastic. Not my favorite. Okay, let's see what it takes to get this pan off. Well, it is quite flexible. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I guess if it wasn't, it would be brittle. This is some work, guys. I don't think that's how you're supposed to do it, but that's just how I did it. Well, the inside of the pan has this sort of uh, mucky aluminum paste. There's some larger chunks. It's very sparkly. It's like a, like a fancy bass boat. Unfortunately, these are the pans that have a captured pickup, so you can't take a look at the screen, or at least they don't want you to look at the screen, which is exactly what we're going to do. We're just gonna gently... That, that worked pretty well. Didn't get us to the screen, though. I broke the screen. Oh no. So there's the inside of the pickup. You pretty much have to destroy these pans. I, I really think these are just one time use. I don't know how you'd clean all this stuff off of plastic. I, I, I bet these are not designed to go back on. I think, you know, these one time use oil pans are just really good for the environment. Next stop, oil pump town. Obviously this is the next step. Everything seems good. I just checked it thoroughly. 
Actually, we're going to open this thing up and take a look. Now, on the second generation of these two sevens, obviously they have a different gear here. I don't know if the actual oil pump is the same or different. I would caution against using a used oil pump from an engine like this that uh, clearly had some metal run through the oiling system. Uh, it might be fine, and that's why we're going to take it apart to find out. And there's your pump. Let's see if I can spin it. Yeah. What's the worst that could happen if I spun this with the impact when the side housing is off of it? I think we're going to find out. Nothing. But let's see if I can go slow enough to show how it works. Now I think we should be able to... Does this not come apart? What? What the what? It'll come apart. I mean, I think it's going to come apart. Oh, it's got a little, uh, it's got a little clip. We must get the clip off. Never had a, had one of these on the channel that was held together like this. Oh yeah, we got this. There we go. And then this should just slide all the way out. There's that shaft. And there's the veins. Um, I guess that's called a hub. I don't know. It actually looks pretty good in here. So there's not a lot of wear on this or on the veins. It's really just about that. And that's really not that bad. Housing doesn't seem to have really any notable wear. Neither does this part. It's in good shape. Now we can work on the block. And this was the part from the last 27 teardown that I was so impressed with. This is just so overbuilt. Now, obviously, that's never a, a bad thing, ever. This is just, the casting is extremely impressive. Unfortunately, because of the design, I have to take two of the bolts out of my engine stand, and I'm not positive at all that two bolts will hold what's left of the block once this aluminum piece is off. We will find out. Start by zipping some bolts out. Here goes bolt number one. Ah, barely even flinched. I'm sure the exact same thing will happen on the other side. Here's the moment of truth. What's gonna happen? Oh, it's moving this bad. Oh, see, it's, it's, it's fine, guys. Don't look at it. Let's touch it. It's fine. You guys doubted me. The next puckering step is to pry on it now that I've removed half the bolts holding the engine to the stand. Remember that fine part? It's going to be that way. Hope we're leaking again. Oh, I got this. Look at that, easy. Now I have access to every connecting rod. But what I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loosen all those, put the caps in order, and then I'll get the main caps broken loose so I can get the crank out before I push the rods and pistons out. Okay, let's crack all of these rod caps loose. That was not supposed to happen, but a rod and piston has just left the block already. Oh, that's dirty now. Did not see that one coming. Well, I'm just gonna assume that's not gonna happen twice. I know that's a bad idea. Well, I think I can just probably push these out now. Yeah, they just, 
come right out. Might not be able to get all of them out that way. I'm still gonna try to get some of the rest of these out. Yeah, these are just practically falling out of their bores. I just have this one. Move the crank out of the way. And all the rods and pistons are out. The very last step is to remove the crankshaft. Okay, now that crank should just come right out, I think. This thing is a problem. But I have blue, so it won't be a problem for very long. First, let's take a look at these rod bearings. So these do have some wear. Some are significantly worse than others. Some have some grooves in them, like some material has run through there. Nothing is too destroyed, it's just, they're just not great. Now for the reason why this engine was replaced. Cylinder one, everything looks pretty good, right? And then you get to cylinder two. Oh, so this thing just is torched all the way through. It blew aluminum all over the top of that rod. And likely that's the material we found everywhere that silvery paste and has run through these bearings. I mean, it even melted through the rings. That's a lot of heat. A lot of heat. You can see straight on through there. What a desk ornament this will be. For somebody, I got enough. So if you'd like to buy some of these, you just got to email us. Now what's interesting is that I couldn't find any damage on the rest of these. But the way they fell out of their bores tells me that this thing had a lot of heat in the upper end, which could be from uh, a lean condition, collapsed rings, or maybe they're just low tension and that's just how they are. I don't have enough experience taking these things down to tell you whether that's normal or not. But I can tell you, I've done this before in my Turbo MX-6. It looked pretty similar. The main bearings are surprisingly worse. That set is really, really rough. This definitely had some of that aluminum from the piston go through it. The crankshaft has some evidence of that. It's not as bad as I expected. I think this is a serviceable crank. It may need some machine work, but nothing terrible. Now the block. Yikes. So that's going to need quite a bit of machine work. That's not going to clean up with some acid. It's actually, if you can tell, it's melted. Like the block itself, the liner. That was a ton of heat. These cylinders have, uh, have some wear as well. Not great, but not like that. And matching the pistons, the rest of these just have normal wear. I didn't see any signs that these cylinders were getting ready to melt, or these pistons were. There are several different variables that make it impossible to point your finger at one cause. We did not see the truck this engine came out of. I don't know how many miles were on it, although I don't think it had too many miles, still had the original spark plug. So let's just assume maybe 100,000 miles, give or take, and that's just a guess. We don't know if this truck was stock. Was it modified? Has it been tuned? Was it a good tune or was it a tune that someone copied from another truck that had different modifications and it wasn't properly tuned for whatever modifications that truck had? 
Was this truck running on premium? Was it on 87 octane, towing two horses on a tandem axle trailer up a mountain pass with their foot to the floor doing 90 miles an hour? Was the fuel system in good shape? Did it have any vacuum leaks? Are the wastegates operational? There's a lot of things that can lead to a melted piston. One thing is absolutely clear, and this applies to all engines, is typically speaking, they will make some, some noise, some racket before they melt a piston. I have melted a piston in my own car and I can tell you it sounds like knocking, pinging a can of marbles that someone's shaking up. If you hear that when your foot's in it, take your foot out of it because you don't have very long to react. And I, I think this person probably, maybe newer vehicles are just a lot quieter inside. It's harder to hear engine situations like this. Either way, uh, this could have been avoided. I, I'm sure it had symptoms before it melted a piston. It's not something that happens in an instant. But this engine was bad. It, we did not take apart a good engine today. I don't think it was oil starvation. I don't think it was any of those things. Maybe it was burning oil and oil lowers octane of fuel. There's a lot of different variables. And I guess my point is pay attention to your vehicle. Listen, your ears are the best tool you have for diagnosis. This engine had several good parts. Most of the bottom end is good, except for the block and one piston. So if you'd like to buy any parts out of this engine, whether it's for your desk or your project or anything else I've torn down or out of this sad, sad 95 Merlot M edition Miata, only 91,000 miles on it. I'm gonna leave our email in the video description. You can also go to importapart.com and peruse our inventory. I've been uploading our parts cars every single week. I've been pretty diligent about that. So I hope you enjoyed this teardown. It was really interesting to see the differences between the Gen 1 and the Gen 2 since I've already done a Gen 2 and I much, much prefer the Gen 1 on the sole, sole fact that it has three chains and not a belt. Now, I do like port injection. I hate plastic oil pans, but the rest of the engine seemed to be pretty well designed. So if you want my opinion of it, so far they're not terrible, but they have a few things I think that they could do a little bit better on. I hope you enjoyed this video. As always, I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.